The following program is brought to you by Bruce Telecom and Whiteman TV. Thank you very much for joining me this morning at the Bruce County Museum and Cultural Center here in Southampton, Ontario. I'm Adam Olivero, and we have uh, one series of Nancy White, the program coordinator here at the Bruce County Museum, has brought in some interesting people to talk about their adventures. It's aptly called Adventure Talks, and we're going to hear one of those talks right now. Thank you, Nancy. Thanks for that introduction. Uh, sitting here waiting to come up when people were coming in. It was nice to hear this happy uh, rumble of voices and chipper voices going across the audience. It was like the birds in spring, you know, and they're, <laughs> they're all happy again. And uh, today, for the first time, I put on my walking shoes instead of my boots. So uh, first time in about eight months, it feels like. So I'm feeling light of foot. As, uh, as Nancy said, I'm... Uh, uh, my reputation is that of a, of a traveler to remote places in, in terms of traveling, in terms of my, my artwork. That's, that's what I, why I go to these places. Um, at least that's the reason I give people. And um, so my, my uh, normal modus operandi is just to uh, find a place that might interest me, go there, have an experience there of some sort, maybe over a period of a month or so, and then come back and try and... Uh, try and uh, convey that experience in, um, in printmaking or in painting to, to, uh, to an audience. Uh, in the last 10 years or so, I've started to write. Uh, some, sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words, sometimes not. And sometimes I felt that uh, I wanted to talk more about some of the things that were in my head. Uh, so, one would ask, well, why are you going then, if you're going to remote places, why are you going to the Ganges and Varanasi, one of the most populated places on earth? And it's a question I ask myself, why do I keep going to these remote places? And I thought uh, I would be curious to see what kind of work I would do in a different place. So it was a bit of a challenge to myself to go there. Uh, I've been going to India for about 10 years previous, uh, and from India going up into the Himalayas, as Nancy said, to travel with nomads. So this time I decided I would go the other way. I would go in an easterly, southeasterly direction to the Ganges and experience this amazing city. So that's what I'm going to uh, try and describe to you uh, this, after, or this morning. Um, I'm going to do it with some photos I took there and some of my artwork. Uh, and I'm going to do some, uh, I'm going to do a bit of reading. Uh, but the book, The Memory of Water, which was published a few years ago, uh, is a collection of uh, autobiographical short stories that cover a 40-year period in my life, starting, uh, I guess, about 1970 and going up to about, 19, or about 2010, uh, Varanasi was 2010. So I'm going to read some passages, inter intermix that I into this uh, presentation. There'll be artwork here. I'm not, I might describe a little bit, but I'm not going to make it an art talk. But after, after we're done, if people want to talk more about that, that would be fine. Yeah, so, you know, one of the things that intrigued me with uh, Varanasi was that in one particular place in the world, uh, it's designated by over a billion people to be sacred, to be holy, and in that same spot, it's also totally defiled. The same, the same thing, the same water is, is, could be seen two different ways, depending how you were thinking about it. This was very curious to me, how, how this could be. Uh, this is a, I'll just talk just very briefly about this. This is an oil painting. Um, 
I think it's morning prayer it's called, and that relief is a, a, a just a, um, a gesso, um, a modeling paste gesso that's, uh, you can see that writing in the background. That's a modeling paste gesso just squeezed out of a, a little squeeze bottle, the writing there. So the Ganges, or Mother Ganga it is called in India, flows from the Himalayan headwaters all the way to the Bay of Bengal. So, can't see it from this angle here. So, uh, flying in, uh, uh, you fly into Delhi, the capital of India, there's Varanasi, the Bay of Bengal. This is the Ganges, and the, the Himalayas are up here. So a lot of tributaries flowing down and going there. So there's where I went from, from Delhi to, to Varanasi. So along this winding route, the Ganges supports uh, 400, over 400, 430 million people. One river supports 430 million people. So that's the whole population of Canada, United States, and Mexico. So Varanasi is about halfway along it, so you've got, you've got all the effluent, all the, all the stuff that's flowing on this river for about 1,200 kilometers uh, flowing past Varanasi. Varanasi is a city of about three million people, not a particularly big city by India, the standards of India. Uh, it is situated in uh, Urdu Pardesh, the most populated state in India. And this uh, one state alone holds two-thirds uh, the amount of people of the United States and is two percent, a little over two percent of its size. So it's a very densely populated state. Uh, and it's considered quite a poor state. The states in India, I don't know, there's 25 or 30 states. Okay. And uh, they, vary, they vary widely, more so than the, the provinces or the states of the United States or, or Canada. So some can be very poor, some not so poor. So this stretch from Varanasi, from uh, Delhi to Varanasi, covered uh, uh, the, the, more, the more impoverished parts of, uh, parts of India. So to get to, um, to get to Varanasi, I hired a taxi. And this is not unusual in, in India. If you've been to India, this is a common, it's a common way to go. It's not particularly expensive. Um, and so you hire the taxi, you hire your driver, and you can go for a day, two days, a week, two weeks, and he stays with you. And he finds a place to sleep, he finds his own way to, uh, to eat, his own food to eat. And you have a set amount of money that you pay him, and you'll tip him at the end or whatever. So it's a very, uh, it's not, it sounds extravagant by, the, by these standards here, but it's not by there. The driver is very important, of course, he's your guide. He could be your protector, advisor, all kind, confidant, all kinds of stuff. Or he could be not so good. You, you don't really know, and it's it's a really uh, it makes a huge difference uh, the, the the type of driver you have. So I'm going to I'm going to talk a little bit about this drive. Um, it was a thousand kilometers from uh, New Delhi to Varanasi, and. Uh, I, it was a four day, it took four days to go. I, I, to call it a drive is a bit of a misnomer. It'd be like referring to Russian roulette as target practice. <laughs> and I had experience. I had nine or ten years of driving, uh, being dri driven around Delhi and then the same amount in the, the mountains of the Himalaya, these switchback high roads, steep drops. I thought I was used to India driving. Not at all. So, I'm going to read from the book here. Well. 
Imagine diverting an expressway's traffic. All the 18-wheelers, all the buses, vans, cars, jeeps, trucks, and motorcycles onto one single lane road. Then add a similar heap of congestion coming the other way. Into any bits of open or surrounding space, densely jam auto rickshaws, they, these are called tuk-tuks, pedestrians, dogs, pigs, herds of sheep and goats, tractors, camels, bicycles, rickshaws, donkeys, horses, oxen, and water buffalo. Then here and there, remove huge chunks of road along with all stop signs, street lights, and all other traffic safety devices. Now in the middle of the road, add the occasional broke down truck, lots of very relaxed stationary cows. Then combine all that with alignment destroying speed bumps that are unmarked and placed randomly where no one expects. Finally, have half of the drivers on the road vying for an opening on a Formula One racing team. That was the Velikir landscape, the obstacle course, the real life video game played out on the roads east of Delhi and undoubtedly on similar Indian roadways every day. The, 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 the deaths on traffic accidents uh, is just astounding. And there's a lot of people in India, but it's like, I forget the statistic now, but it's like every three minutes someone dies in India on a traffic accident. My driver's name was Rajiv. Uh, he was just appointed to me. Um, he was a, a turbanless Sikh in his mid-twenties who was raised in the Punjab. As a driver, he was both aggressive and amazing. Amazing in that he was still alive. <laughs> he proudly proclaimed to have had only one major accident in four years of driving a taxi. He took great pride in the multitude of little straight marks and little dents on his white panels of the front and back of his car, a complete color-coded near-collision diary of his professional career. <laughs> so I was, um, I was in, a st like I was in, the, in the passenger seat. I wasn't comfortable. I was sort of white-knuckled holding onto this rail beside him. And of course, you don't, I, I'm going to be with him for, you know, four or five days. I, I don't want to start a conflict with him. I want to, you know. So I, I'm holding off saying, look, you're not, I don't like the way you're driving. Because he was very proud of being a driver. That was his occupation. So um, finally, I couldn't take it anymore. And I, I told him, I said, Rajiv, you know, I come here, I don't come here to have a near-death experience. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to just see stuff. I want to stop, you know, and let's. Can we just take it easy? He says, you don't like my driving, sir? Well, no, you're, you're a good driver, but you're too aggressive. I'm not too aggressive, sir. No, I'm a good driver. I said, well, Rajiv, we're passing a thousand cars for every car that passes us. That's, that's aggressive. So that, he, he was insulted. That was like he was very proud of his driving, and this was, you know, to see lots of places quickly uh, this, is, this is what a good driver does. <laughs> yeah. But in, in, um, in India, there really doesn't seem to be any rules of the road. It's sort of a code of the road. And there's things like the center, the center line, if there is one, doesn't really mean anything. And uh, of all the things in a car that's important, like wheels, steering wheel, that sort of thing, the most important thing is the horn. Without the horn, you have no chance of surviving there. And the horn, like here the horn means maybe two things. It's like, see you later, and what the hell are you doing, you know. There, how they honk the horn, the same horn, but how they honk it means about 20 different things. It's quite a vocabulary they have. And the flashing lights, they do that too. So, I'm going to Varanasi. Um, this was an amazing place. Uh, the, uh, the, the, main, uh, the main thing for, for those uh, that are pilgrims that come to, like Varanasi is sort of like Mecca for Muslims. For the, for the Hindus, coming to Varanasi is, is something they should do in their life. And washing themselves in the Ganges, washing away sins, this is very important, and um, if possibly if you can be cremated there. And some people come there near death just to wait to die, 
to be, cremate, to be cremated. So the, the, the cremations are happening all along the river um, in, in uh, two spots. I'll, I'll show you that just a little later. Lonely Planet Guidebook. It's a, it's a great book. I'm sure many of you uh, have used it. But here's what they say about Varanasi. One, wonderful uh, two sentences. First, first way they describe Varanasi and Lonely Planet. Brace yourself. You are about to enter one of the most blindingly colorful, unrelentingly chaotic, and unapologetically indiscreet places on Earth. Coming into Varanasi, I'm not quite... Uh, I'm not quite done with the traffic stuff. Got a little more, a little more to discourage you from coming. Inside the unrelenting mayhem of Varanasi, the roads were essentially moving parking lots. With the addition of camels, horses, donkeys, dogs, pedestrians, rickshaws, bicycles, vendors, and of course the ever blissed out cattle. The moving theater surrounding me was well beyond bizarre. I counted 20 people piled onto and into and hanging off of one three-wheeled tuk-tuk. Some people pedaled bicycles without hands. Some moved on trolleys without legs. The road was so full that its surface couldn't be seen. Most everyone seemed to have great quantities of stuff that they were hauling, carting, peddling, carrying, pushing, or pulling somewhere. It was the apex of saturated humanity. Yet incredibly, the congregate never stood still. Everything, in little fits and starts, in tiny increments, kept jostling onward. The streets were a molten flow melding, separating, and reforming as if part of one great tentacled matrix of bone and muscle, alloyed steel, glass, rubber, and polymer fiber. When the moving mass intersected other lanes, it was often without the benefit of traffic authorities. No inch was given, and no inch was not taken. Actually, inch is too generous. Centimeter would be more accurate. I could read the second hand on the wristwatch on the motorcycle's throttle hand through my side window. <laughs> as we jostled for a position, a rickshaw scraped our side mirror just as our bumper pushed against a pedestrian's leg. Rajiv hit the brakes and cursed the auto rickshaw driver and the pedestrian. The road peddlers and beggars saw their chance. Cheap, cheap stuff jammed the window glass while others with hollowed eyes pleaded with empty palms. My driver, like every other driver, kept his hand on the horn nonstop. So here's the great Mother Ganga. Now, the, the really there's so many amazing parts of this city, but one of the really interesting ones was that you go through all this traffic, all this noise, and then the roads all stop, and they all stop about um, maybe 75, 100 yards from the river. So there's no roads to the river. So you have to park and walk through these narrow, winding alleyways that are just maybe this wide or this wide. And there's, it, it, it's like going back to like 14th century London, England or something. There's garbage everywhere, there's urine, there's feces, there's pigs, there's chickens. There, and and these, these walls go up maybe two stories. There's balconies, there's little shops. They could be selling anything on earth, from sitar lessons to uh, drugs to uh, a, a little sh cafe. So you just wind your way through all this stuff, and then, boom, you come out on the Ganges uh, River. Uh, and then the same way back. So you have to carry your stuff in. Everything along these little alleyways, people are always carrying stuff. And motorcycles can go through there. Uh, some um, uh, little rickshaws. Uh, people are carrying corpses. You know, there's all, all, it's just everything. Just this crazy world. Uh, oh, yeah. <clears throat> it was interesting. This uh, book by um, Jeff Dyer, a, a British writer. Uh, he wrote a book called Jeff in Venice, Death in Varanasi, and he has a nice quote in it. His first experience with the uncleanliness of uh, what he was seeing in uh, Varanasi, he wrote it this way. 
filth, pure filth, filth without contamination. <laughs> now this is the uh, this is the Ganges from the water's edge, and I wanted to point out this when I I didn't know the room I was going to get, and I'm going to point it out to you. You see that dome thing there? You see those windows? Little balcony. That was my room. And I, I, so you walk through all this stuff, these alleyways at the back, and then go through all this stuff, and then boom, they open the door, and there's a six-sided room where I had a 180-degree view of, and this is not expensive. Like, this is, you just, poor people living along here. This is all poor people. And, and I, this wasn't a special room or something. I didn't know what I got. I just got a room. And uh, there it was. And these are called gats, these steps. And each gat has a generally a different purpose. And I'll talk about that a little later. But this, this kind of pedestrian walkway goes along for maybe four or five kilometers. And there's maybe 90 gats or something like that. Uh, so it, I was in love with this place, except the room. <laughs> Yeah, the room had a few little things. One was uh, it didn't lock from the inside. You could lock it when you leave, but you couldn't lock it inside. So I said to the proprietor, I said, I can't lock my door from the inside. He says, oh, no problem, sir. You'll be inside. <laughs> <laughs> and it had, a, it had a reptile about this long in the bathroom who just clung to the wall. And it had these rodent-like rats in the hallway. But they weren't really rats. They were something else, like a, between a squirrel and a rat. And on uh, this tree here was the home of a whole bunch of Langer monkeys. They were huge. They were like little people. And uh, you had to be very careful because they were aggressive. They weren't scared of people. So they would come into your room. They could rip your room apart. So you had to sort of defend yourself from <laughs> some other things. So this is uh, uh, one, of the, one of the reasons people come to uh, the Ganges is, well, there's, there's people that are curious, kind of like me, and then there's pilgrims uh, that come from India, as I said, and um, they bathe in, in the water, uh, cremations, ashes put out into the uh, Ganges, and if you can't afford it, it's fairly expensive to be cremated at the water for a lot of the people of India. So uh, in that case, the body will just be put into the, the river, just taken out, rode out a little bit and dumped into the river. I saw that happen many times. So they bring wood in. Uh, the, the, uh, the pyres are, are uh, fueled with wood that they collect from about 300 kilometers down river. So there's a constant flow of boats and, and wood coming in and uh, I haven't got, I, I, in, the, in, the, in the book, The Memory of Water, out there I've got all the, the amount of wood it takes to burn a body and so forth, but uh, I forget it right off the bat now. So there's two burning sites uh, on these ghats. Like, they don't burn bodies everywhere. There's two sites. Each one has about 10 or 12 fires going at one time. And you can see here, this is very interesting. Oh, one of the things is, is the, these boats, these wonderful rowboats. There's a few are motorized, but most are just handmade boats with bamboo oars. And it's, it's really wonderful. Just, and it's not that expensive. You can hire a boat and just go up and down the river, and this guy's rowing. And it's the great thing to understand, it's so unusual. When you get into these, along the water there, uh, the wonderful thing is there's no noise. <coughs> There's no cars, there's no honking, there's no, it, it just, it, it's just like all that's gone. And you're in this other strange world. And even on the water, it's not boats ripping back and forth. It's just these, pat, you can hear the oars paddling back and forth. And you notice on the, see this, this is the Ganges, and you see it's about a half a kilometer wide. And you see the other side, and you saw the side with Varanasi on it, was jam-packed. There's nothing on that side, all the way along. It's like the city got ripped in half. 
along the water's edge and half thrown away. And I asked this, why, how, how could you have a city of three million people? That, like they've got bridges across, it's not like they can't get across. And there's nothing happening there. And th this idea of, um, of, of cremation and going to another place, uh, they want to keep that empty. So just, just in the soul and in the heart and in the mind, this is another, this is a kind of a, uh, a, a symbol of another destination. These guys are hawking stuff, so of course when they spot somebody like me hiring another boat to row them, they come up with all their stuff wanting to sell stuff to me. Now this is an oil painting I did. Uh, it's not quite that big, but it's a big piece. Um, I had a show of this work from Varanasi in, uh, in Toronto a year or two ago. So this is, um, this is one of the main burning sites. This is a Haas this here, oh, 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 oh wrong, long, wrong little thing. This is a hospice here. So a lot, of, a lot of people are dying in here, waiting to go down here. So. This, this bathing, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's everybody. It's the, the bejeweled, the beautiful, the, the impoverished. I'll, if I have time, I'll talk about the caste system there. But anyway, everybody, it's all, uh, it's not you think a bunch of ignorant people come there and bathe. And they drink the water, too. And if you go on, if you go on eBay, you'll, you'll, if you can't, go there and get water, you can order water from the Ganges. But I saw it happen many times, people, people taking uh, jugs, in fact they sell empty jugs there so you can take the water and take it with you. But it's, it's uh, all, everybody, everybody, I shouldn't say everybody, of course some people wouldn't do it, but uh, it was amazing. Uh, and not just little token simps, sometimes they're, they're gulping it down. This idea that, and, and the Ganges, uh, uh, analyzing the water, going back a little bit, uh, you know, when science was just meeting up with the Ganges and it wasn't totally polluted, for some reason, unexplained reason, the Ganges uh, has the ability to hold more oxygen than most water. And it does not stagnate as quickly as most water, most river water does. And uh, it, there's a science, the scientific explanation for this is, is, uh, is a bit obscure. But uh, now, of course, with uh, tons and tons of industrial waste and effluent flowing there, uh, if it once had that power, which is still in the minds of Hindus, uh, I don't know if it has any longer. And then there's lots of diseases uh, uh, that, are, that have occurred, obviously, from, from this water uh, among uh, the people of India. So I'll, I'll just read you a little bit from the book again, if you don't mind. Each morning I was greeted with the sun's rays coming across the river directly through my balcony door and window. Each day started with the same rhythm, a quiet, smoky dawn, gradually giving way to the sounds and energy of light and life along the river. By late morning, the sun and the updrafts off the water had only partly diminished the thick haze. As the day progressed, scores of insect-feeding swallows and hundreds and hundreds of small, colorful square kites danced and darted high over the Ganges in the river. Mostly the kites mimicked the swallows until, like kamikaze pilots, they plunged to their end or floated helplessly down into the river or the cityscape. Tangled fishing lines and snared kites were draped and wrapped around every pole, electric wire, and building protrusion. Apart from flying kites, playing cr cricket seemed to be the chief passion of Varanasi kids and young men. With no flat, open areas anywhere, the Gat steps suffice as the cricket grounds. Strolling tourists and pilgrims, the river moored boats, wandering cows and water buffalo, 
were all within the field of play. It's quite nice at night, these little corsages, this is early morning, but these little corsages hold a little candle. So they, they light, it. so at night, these slowly drift along the water, all these little lights on the water. Now that's the view from my, uh, that's the view west from my uh, room window. This is the Hadobe Gat, and it's just, uh, as you can see, it's just a stone's throw away from my place. And every morning here, uh, dozens of uh, launderers would be knee deep. You can see them there at the water, right in there. So they're washing clothes and then putting the clothes up here to dry. So rocks on the water, pounding, pounding, pounding. This would be low caste people, right? This would be what they do. And they would, they would be doing, not just their, they would not be doing their laundry particularly, that would be paid to do laundry for other people. So this would start early morning, and this would be facing south. And with this angle, these clothes would dry pretty quickly. And then in the mid-afternoon, uh, water buffalo come to this site. Herds of what? Whoop, whoop, where are we now? I'll operate this thing yet. Herds of buffalo, water buffalo, would come to this site. <clears throat> These are huge beasts. And of course, they'd be defecating everywhere. So um, there would be an older person and uh, some young kids, and they would collect the dung while it's still soft, form it into patties, and put it up where the clothes were to dry. And that, that this would be sold as fuel. So I scoffed at this. I scoffed, of course, to myself at this idea of drying clothes where you're drying dung, you know, the next day. Until I realized that the sheets I was sleeping in between would have been serviced exactly <laughs> this way. <clears throat> now this, um, this piece, uh, this is a watercolor. Uh, several of the, th the pieces I've showed you have been watercolors, but this thing here, this is, um, this is just uh, uh, deities and, and, uh, and images. I bought these, uh, some of these, some, some of them are carvings, some of them are just fridge magnets. And I made a, um, I used clay, pressed them into clay so I had a negative mold, and then uh, made paper, poured paper over it, then pulled the paper off. And so this is actually paper uh, that I made and, and, and sort of put together as a, as a border. And, and I did this, uh, I did this with other, with other things as well. So uh, the wonderful thing with me on this, and I think, you know, the, as an artist and a writer, it's nice to be the fly on the wall. Uh, and this is hard to do when you're in a remote area and you're the only white person around or something like that. I found myself in that situation where everyone's looking at you instead of, you observing people just going about their business naturally. That was the great thing about Varanasi. There was so much going on, there were so many other things that you could just, you could just be there, you could be drawing, you could, and you wouldn't attract attention no matter what you did. You could be urinating and you still wouldn't draw attention. In fact, that would be the thing that would draw the least attention. <laughs> I'll just read you this, this funny little bit here, again from the book. An important part of every visitor's itinerary was a boat ride. Dozens and dozens of boatmen worked the gats, coaxing pilgrims and tourists aboard the boats. The boatmen and beggars were just two of the many groups that hustled their wares and services on the gats. 
The shaving of heads and beards was always on offer, this being a, a Hindu uh, mourning, uh, mourning as if grieving ritual. Postcards, other souvenirs, and shoe shines were constantly being offered. The totes come on usually would start with, Sir, where are you from? Or, hello, sir, what is your name? One quickly learned never to acknowledge such questions. Knowing that, some totes worked with more cunning, a direct, head-on approach with arm extended for a handshake together with a, hello, sir, good to meet you, was harder to ignore. If you extended your arm for a handshake, you might not get it back. These totes would immediately start a rubbing and kneading action, which would eventually grow into a massage and end up with a demand for payment. One day I watched an unsuspecting young Brit as the hand manipulation started. The young bloke asked for the tout to stop. The tout responded with, no, sir, no money, sir, just massage. The massage went up the arm as the chuckling Brit said, okay, okay, but no money, remember, no money. Another masseur quickly latched on to the Brit's other hand and started rubbing the fingers and palm, working its way up the arm. Again, okay, sure, if you want, but remember, I'm not paying. Then a third and fourth tout entered the picture and started working on the legs. The young traveler was trying to suppress his laughter with his arms and legs spread eagled as if being frisked by cops. All the time he kept reminding them that he wasn't going to pay, which of course didn't deter the touts in the least. They kept hold of the young guy's limbs like lions on a gazelle. Of course, in the end, he had to pay to get them to stop. Now this would be a motorized boat. This would be a, probably a big, uh, lo looks like uh, a big group coming from some part of India together to the Ganges. Uh, maybe, the, maybe it's a death in the family, something like that. And um, and everything is auspicious, the, you know, like feeding the gulls, because the gulls, the, the Hindus have like 30, 40,000 gods and deities. And what, what was the deity in the past, you know, they're, they're, uh, when they die, they get reborn as another deity, and they, they keep part of what they were into what they're going to be. Uh, after, after this, I went to Rajasthan, uh, and in Rajasthan I visited, to give you an example of this, uh, I know I'm making fun of it, but I can't help it, but um, uh, there's a rat temple there. And the rats there are all deities. And there's like 10,000 rats. And you have to take off your shoes and you go into this temple. And again, it's like Varanasi. It's people from all over India come there. They're, it's very de they're very devout about it, very serious about it. And there's rats there everywhere. And they've got, a, they've got a cauldron of food that men are mixing food for them, feeding them. And the people actually will eat the rat food. And this is going to be auspicious, connecting them with with these uh, sacred uh, deities. And, uh, you know, there's rat urine and rat piss, and you've got to take your shoes off to go in there. So it's, 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 you know, it's very strange. It's a very inclusive religion. You know, it's very opposite to the Muslims, you know, which, which has one god, and, and you can't even depict this god. Here, everything could be a god. The motorcycles. I saw a shrine for motorcycles. This was... Some decided this was going to be a deity. So it's a, it's a very, very inclusive, uh, amazingly inclusive religion. And this, uh, I'll talk about it a little later. I think this reflects on what's happening at the Ganges. Here's that border again, the paper thing I did. It's a, it's a watercolor, a guy having tea. The most attention-grabbing uh, for me were the sadhus, these holy men. And this would be his total possessions, what he's got on him right now. And he would spend his life just maybe staying in one place, uh, maybe wandering India, and thinking and talking and reaching this enlightened state in his mind. And these guys were, uh, they weren't beggars, although they would, they would like money if you had some. Uh, but they wanted to talk. 
about life, about um, what you're doing and why you're doing it and the meaning of life and so forth. Was, these were very interesting fellows. I was captured by them totally for a couple of reasons. One, just visually, they were just amazing looking people. And the other one, just can you imagine just giving up everything and just going off and g trying to reach this other plane without collecting possessions. And I. I was interested in this with the nomads, because the nomads, uh, although quite different than the sadhus, when you're nomadic, you can't be hauling around, you can't be collecting a lot of stuff, because you can't haul it around. And these were Tibetan Buddhists, um, these nomads in the Himalayas. So I was quite interested in this compared to our culture, which we, we really define ourselves by the quality and the amount of stuff we have. We say we don't, but actually, if you look at it, we certainly do compared to, to some of these people. So I was very interested in that, that, that road. How do, you, how do you assess yourself then, if, you, if it's not with stuff? What is, what is the means in which you're trying to impress yourself or impress others or whatever, whatever we try to do? There's a lot of different sects of, of, um, of sadhus. Um, uh, a whole bunch, and some are some walk around naked and ash smeared like like Borneo hit hunters, and, um, and it's a fascinating. And, and they're highly respected in India. They can board trains without being without paying and stuff. They're they're treated as they're treated seriously as holy men. <clears throat> Now this is an oil painting. You can see that same kind of uh, motif around the outside, but I used a modeling paste. Uh, paper wouldn't do it with oil on canvas, so I, I used a modeling, a gesso modeling paste, poured that in and then pulled it off and uh, put it on the canvas with this painting in the middle. So the women there are, were, were very colorful and not, not so much, well, in, in, they were all from all over India in, uh, in Varanasi, but uh, uh, this woman looked like to me that she would have been from uh, the west side, from Rajasthan. Uh, the, the women there are, are fantastic. They've got all this jewelry, you know, things from the nose back to the ear and all kinds of stuff. and, and uh, they're, they don't wear burqas, they're, they're Hindu, but they have the veil and sort of eye contact when you're, when you're not married, eye contact with a strange male is not forbidden, but there's that, there's a bit of shyness or whatever there. So, uh, very captivating. So again, that's that same view. This is a watercolor and I think it's a, I used a pastel over the watercolor. <clears throat> that's the same view at sundown with the, the same direction that you saw that other shot. So this kind of inclusiveness, you know, that I talked about their religion, you can see that with the Ganges, where they use the Ganges as a toilet, a bathtub, a laundromat, a toxic dump, a cemetery, as well as a divine goddess. Same place. So I'm just going to talk, I'm just going to try to wrap this up with, I've written, a, I'm just going to read a little bit, a page or so, <clears throat> I guess two pages here on uh, how I wrapped up this thinking, but when I left, how I wrapped up thinking about the, uh, my experience there. Varanasi, in place, in, Varanasi is a place of contradictions, contrasts, and extremes. Essentially, to me, it was an upside-down world where white is black and black is white. Unlike any other famous world-attracting waterfronts that I've heard of, this one neither serviced the elite nor was controlled by it. There were no high-rise condos to take up the best views or waterfront penthouses for the wealthy. No five-star hotels or four or three or restaurants with leather-bound menus and linen and silver place settings. 
Anything smacking of privilege was absent, pushed back into the city, away from the water. Similarly, there was an utter lack of high-end retailing along the river. No parquets, no interlocking brick sidewalks, or, pot or potted flower arrangements, or decorative heritage-themed lighting. No standardized signage or anything of the sort. There were no off-limit areas, no restrictions of entry. There was nothing to intimidate the commoner or any member of the lowest caste. In fact, the entire waterfront was run by the lowest caste. Rules were few, no photographs of cremations and no alcohol consumed in the presence of Mother Ganga. These were rules that could quickly be overridden with a few rupees though. If nothing else, Varanasi at its core was about the common people. If there was intimidation, it was felt by the indulged. Their equilibrium must have been whiplashed as they wandered about soaking in the sights, sounds, and smells of the ghats and galleys. Galleys are these, these alleyways. The activities along the river were timeless, almost biblical. A complete high-tech void where apps, G's, tweets, and even the combustion engine were absent, sucked away into some distant dark hole. In its place were kites flown by kids and bouncing balls hit with sticks, men whacking wet garments against river stones and callous hands rowing handmade boats with bamboo oars. Like an ancient warrior caste, strange-looking gold-robed men with painted faces drifted about, giving guidance to those in need of guidance. Other men unloaded wood, tended fires, cremated the dead, shined shoes, cut hair, and shaved heads. Worship occurred at the same place where mongrel dogs slept and water buffaloes swam, <clears throat> a temple of common ground without walls or roofs or golden spires. Was Varanasi stuck in a pre-industrial past, or was I glimpsing something else? The future, perhaps. A post-apocalyptic world with a new order and a new culture. A city that it had adapted and survived. After half of it had been annihilated and left uninhabitable across a dying river. For those who had been spared, everything changed. The event had become the Rubicon, where thereafter the obsession with newness and growth was seen as dangerous and was shunned. Central governance, intellectualizing, the seeking of status and technological advancement and secularism with its institutions, bureaucracies, regulations, and corporate structures were no longer trusted or allowed. Instead, from the alleyways and the gats rose an ethos of other values. Those of the raw earth, not just the organic, but the feral and the primal. Truth was found in wood, fire, and blazing pyres in asceticism, painted skin and garland flowers, in monkey gods and in handwork, and in the handmade, in prayer beads and in incense and mantras, and in blessed water, there to be used exactly as you wish. <clears throat> it's interesting, <clears throat> there might be another slide here. It's interesting, you know, this, this idea that I've had here of, of the future you can sort of sense it uh, today, you know, when you see this fundamentalism uh, in, the, uh, in Iraq now with ISIS and uh, you can see it with, uh, with some of the, um, uh, with some of the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the religious thinking in the United States with the fundamentalism and not believing in, uh, in evolution and so forth. I mean, you can see this kind of, as we go plunging forward into this great, uh, this great world of computers and uh, this technolo technological knowledge-based world. And there's a lot of people looking back, looking way back, and wanting the values from way back there. Um, <clears throat> just talk a little bit about to what I'm up to. I, 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 uh, the, the show I've just finished uh, painting is from West Africa. I was, I was there doing some fishing villages uh, but a year ago, and uh, I'm going to show that, I'll have that show in Toronto. And I've been working on this play, as Nancy mentioned, um, uh, the portrait. Um, we took this down to Stratford about a year ago, 
uh, got a good response there. Uh, reworked it a little bit. It's a two-act play. Um, got a great cast of, of people. It's based on a true story of my life when I first went up to Tobermory in 1969 as a young artist. When Tobermory was, uh, you know, certainly a good part fishing village and uh, my experience with that. And uh, I'm very proud of the uh, Roxy Theater, uh, and Own Sound Little Theater for uh, doing this. Their, their normal staple is uh, time-tested classics that they do, and uh, I'm really glad that, uh, and, and it's a very professional theater. Uh, if you've been there, you know the, the theater itself, the acting, the musicians, the behind the scenes <coughs> stuff. Uh, and I think it's missing playwrights. You know, I think we need to tell our own stories as well as listening to other stories from other people. I, I think we need to encourage people to tell the stories of this area, uh, tell it to ourselves and tell it to others. So uh, that's, that's happening in a month. The, the seats are selling. Uh, if you want a good seat, uh, I'd encourage you to uh, just put it in order and uh, be closer to the front than the back. Um, I don't think I've got anything else. Is, maybe we can just have the lights on a bit and th there might be some questions. <clears throat> my, my voice is gradually deteriorating, so good, uh, good we're ending. Any questions for Adam? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, did you ever feel unsafe while you were trapped, other than the driver? <laughs> did you feel personal enmity towards yourself at all, because you were white? Uh, yeah, yeah I, I, I won't go in. I was going to tell you this other story, but I, maybe I think we don't have time. Um, but I have, yeah, I have. Uh, you're, you, are, uh, you are a mark, and there are people that are very, very, very poor. And there, there are times when, you know, you're dri in those poor states, you're driving at night in a taxi. Taxis won't drive at night. Even that crazy driver I had wouldn't drive at night in some of those poor states because you can be stopped by robbers and killed for 100 rupees, which I think is about two bucks. You know, so there, there you are, you know, if you're white and you've got the camera and you've got the, you know, they can tell right away who you are and what you've got. You've flown here. They've got nothing, you've got all this stuff, you know. So they, it's like, hey, wait a minute. So there's, you can be a very, very small percentage of the population like it is here, but it happens. And there's a lot of people in close proximity, so. It's tough for a woman to travel there. Women do now travel alone. There's a lot of young women traveling alone, and they have a, it's a problem. It, particularly if they're young and, and attractive with blonde hair, Holy smokes, it's like Jesus walking in, in, in a public place. They've just got a surround of people. See, women there, women, uh, we all know this, I think, women there are not, eligible women are kind of not out and about. You have to have an escort. So you just go on the streets of Delhi or the streets of a place, you just see men everywhere. And it's, and it's a young country, so a lot of young men. So, uh, and, you know, Bollywood, if you've seen Bollywood films or they get these Hollywood films, you, you get a lot of uh, these young men, uh, they're, it's arranged marriages, they don't get a chance to date. So, you know, these young men are looking for women and they're seeing all these uh, available women that are having wonderful romps with men on, on the movie screen. So it's dangerous for a woman. Uh, it's, there's no getting around that. It, you just got to be careful as a, as a, as a, as a traveling woman and uh, as, a, as, an Indi as a young Indian woman. And there's, I, it's been in the news. There's been lots of examples of it, but you, we just hear a little bit. When I was there, the papers every day was just assaults. Yeah, it was just assaults. And it, they just set up the dynamic where you're going to have assaults. I mean, if you, these young men can't date, if they can't go out, the women are cloistered away somewhere. And you show them pictures of all this romping around. I mean, it's, it's a danger. They've set a dangerous uh, template as far as I'm concerned. Anything else? Yes? Uh, just to say, I was there in November. Uh huh. And thank you very much. We just brought back all kinds of. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Your picture of the traffic, we tried desperately to get a picture that would really show the traffic. 
Yeah. Lots yeah. But without the horns, it's not. <laughs> no. No, and I, I come back here, you know, and I always think of Toronto as a busy place. When I fly back into the airport and go down to Toronto or, you know, right after that Indian experience, which I always thought was chaotic, you know, living up in Big Bay, and I'd go down to Toronto and it would be, after India, it would be, oh, this is so nice and quiet. <laughs> really, I have that feeling. Everything's so ordered and clean and nice, yeah. Mm, yes. Well, thank you very much for joining me. Again, I'm at the Bruce County Museum and Cultural Center here in beautiful Southampton, Ontario. And that was quite an interesting talk that Alan had about his adventures. They've always got these kinds of adventure talks happening here at the museum and the theatre. Make sure you visit brucemuseum.ca for more information.
The preceding program was brought to you by Bruce Telecom and Whiteman TV.